Good morning, everybody. This is Leah with Headwater Science Institute, and welcome to Lent with a Scientist. Today, we are going to get to know Dr. Deborah Thompson. Hi, Deborah. How are you? Hi, good. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we are really excited to have Deborah here. So Deborah is the founder of One Health Lessons. Uh, she develops lessons for children that help build the connection between human health and the health of animals and the environment. She is a veterinarian, a science policy ad, ad, excuse me, a science policy advisor, a first responder, an award-winning public speaker and musician, and overall One Health advocate. And of course, as I said, the founder of OneHealthLessons.com, where she teaches incredible interactive science lessons for people of all ages. So today she's going to share in some insights on her career path and talk about making careers um, happen in the science field. And before I turn it over to her, I just want to thank the Silver Stage Center for Family Medicine in Reno, Nevada, for sponsoring this episode. Thank you so much. It's an awesome family medicine center. Thank you for sponsoring us. So without further ado, Deborah, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. I will now share my screen. Does it look fine on your end? Yes, you are all here. Perfect. Okay. Hi, everybody. It's a honor to be here. I'm Dr. Deborah Thompson, and I will be talking to you about a lot of career decisions that I've had to make in going into science. Um, science, you know, it's one of those one of those um, disciplines that I feel like whenever I talk to students, I emphasize the the role of curiosity. You know, if you're a curious, uh, if you are curious and you're going to be a fantastic scientist, um, you have to have perseverance. You also have to have flexibility. So this particular talk is more like a career day type talk. And you will learn um, about me and about my mission right now. And um, let's get started. Now, when it comes to career path, my career path was far from a straight line. And you know what? That was okay in the end. It's been a little bit of a roller coaster, but we'll ride that roller coaster together. At least in the meantime, for each step that I've taken in my career, I've learned some valuable life skills. Now, when I was your age, 16 years old, 17 years old, 18, I was interested in so many things. And honestly, I'm the same way still. I was considering being a statistician when I was younger, a musician, a physician, so a human doctor, a zookeeper because I love animals, an educator because teaching is fun, <laughs> an ecotourism guide or director, and that way I could travel and work with animals and people, a playwright because simply that's super cool. <laughs> An ecologist because I love being outdoors and working with animals and the environment. A marine biologist. I mean, how many of you out there wanted to become a marine biologist? And then an architect because I find beauty in everything. Last but not least, a veterinarian. And so when I finally thought of maybe becoming a veterinarian, that was after I followed around two different veterinarians or animal doctors. One was working pretty much out of his truck, going from farm to farm to farm, working with horses and cows and dogs and cats. And then the other veterinarian that I was shadowing um, worked with mainly dogs and cats and small animals. So I got to see a wide variety of what veterinary medicine can bring. I also thought that as a veterinarian, not only do I have an impact on the animal, so my my patients, but also the people who rely on these animals, either the people who rely on these animals for food, for milk, if it's a cow, um, or just simple well-being and uh, mental health. So. Truly, I see that the impact and the reach of being a veterinarian is farther than a lot of other professions. And that's why I wanted to go with the veterinary field. But first, in North America, you have to have an undergraduate degree. Now, I actually had two different undergraduate degrees, two bachelor's degrees, and you can imagine how 
incredibly uh, hard that could have been, <laughs> and it was. Um, not not lying about that. That was really really difficult. And so you you can imagine that the music degree and science degree, they don't really have overlap of mandatory classes. So I was really doubling up on the work workload. But the interesting thing is when it comes to McGill, I and that's in Montreal, Quebec in Canada. Uh, halfway through my first year, my flute teacher, you could see me here on the left, um, my flute teacher told me that I barely got into the school based on my audition. But it's interesting to think about that time because number one, that wasn't a very nice thing to say. <laughs> number two, that comment pushed me to work even harder. And at that point, I, I started practicing and playing eight to 10 hours a day. Um, and in order to get that audition for McGill University, I was at that time teaching myself because my flute teacher stopped teaching uh, students and that was about six months before my audition. So um, truly perseverance <laughs> pays off. Now, when it comes to the bachelor's of science degree, I added that officially at the end of my first term, oh, excuse me, my first year at McGill. And I found myself near the uh, junior year, so third year of my bachelor's degree, where I was on a beach doing a, a study, um, a, a field course for marine biology. And I found myself on a beach very similar to this. And it was like paradise. It was beautiful. But I realized on that beach that I would actually rather be in a veterinary hospital than be in that beach. So that was my aha moment. So what was my next step? You think veterinary school was my next step? Nope. <laughs> nope. I applied. I applied, but I did not get in. So why didn't I get in? One of the most important things you can do is learn from failure and learn from experiences. So I contacted the two veterinary schools. That was my first mistake, just applying to two veterinary schools. And I asked, why not? Why, why didn't I make it to you know the acceptance letter? And they said simply, it was my GRE scores, my graduate record exam scores. That hurt. You can imagine how much that hurt. Um, and I was thinking, my goodness, what am I gonna do for the next year? I'll have to make money. <laughs> Where am I gonna go? Um, and in the next year, I took the GREs exams. Another time, I wasn't satisfied. Another time, I wasn't satisfied. Another time, and then I'm like, okay, maybe these scores will be good enough. But where did I go in the interim? That's a whole year you need to figure out. Well, I moved from Montreal and I went to Quebec City. And you can imagine Quebec City, 98% of the population when I was living there spoke French. So I was teaching English language learners um, who were as young as 11 years old to as old as 70 years old, um, how to speak English and how to read in English, how to communicate well in English. I was also working as a musician, doing uh, wedding gigs and working with receptions and things like that. So that's how I spent my interim year. And you know what? That interim year that was completely unwanted or unexpected because I did not get into veterinary school, that's changed my life because now I can speak French much better <laughs> and I can... I know how to teach well. And when it comes to different age groups, uh, I can address different age groups in different ways. So I felt like life skills were learned that year, even though it was an ex unexpected year. So you have to be flexible in life and not just see yourself you know, with blinders on. So what's next? I taught in a middle school for a whole year in Quebec City and well, I never lost my um, passion for veterinary medicine, so I reapplied. This time I applied to a lot more schools <laughs> and I thought, okay, my GRE scores are substantially better. 
I have the exact same grades, the exact same experience. Let's see if this will actually work. So I drove down to the United States um, for some interviews, which I was incredibly grateful for. And then I picked up the phone one day and it was from a vet school. And I was expecting a yes or a no, an acceptance or the other option, a rejection, right? Instead, what I got was a second invitation to go back down to the United States from Canada and re-interview with other people. Because I heard that later on, that one person said, yes, she's good to come in. And then the other person said, uh, I'm not so sure. <sighs> so my adventure at that time uh, was nowhere near ending. <laughs> So I drove back down to the United States, took that second interview, and I fortunately got accepted to the school. Now, when I went to Tufts, I earned a Doctor of Veterinary Medicine degree, and then I also earned a Certificate in International Veterinary Medicine. And with the Certificate of International Veterinary Medicine, I was able to do two different types of research projects abroad, working with animals, and particularly with a One Health focus. And we're going to dive into what One Health means in just a moment. But to give you an idea of what I did actually for this research that I designed, well, when it comes to this creature here, it's a water buffalo, and I was working in Nepal. And these water buffalo live in huts and shelter that look like this. This is actually a pretty big one compared to other, other shelters for animals. Now, I was measuring something called mastitis, which is inflammation of the udder. And I was measuring the incidence, like the occurrence, um, how often mastitis happens in the community of water buffalo. Now, something important to know about mastitis or inflammation of the udder is that if you if the animal lives in a dirty environment, the chance of mastitis increases. So what I wanted to see was, do the farmers um, with these animals in their backyards understand and appreciate the what we call animal husbandry? So the maintenance of the environment of the animal, so making sure that it keeps clean, and how the cleanliness of the environment plays into animal health. Now that's really, really, really important for these people because it affects their livelihood. You can see that this man here is milking the water buffalo because he will ultimately not only use that milk for himself and his family, but he's selling that milk. He's getting um, school supply money for his children with that milk. He can make cheese with that milk, right? So it's a livelihood. These people are dependent on these animals. And so if the environment near these animals is not necessarily the cleanest, then you can have inflammation of the udder in the animals. And then from there, when you have inflammation of the udder, the quality of milk decreases and the quantity of milk decreases. And that's a big problem for the pocketbook of the family. So that is a one health concept, environmental health, animal health, and human health, all rolled up into one. So another example of one health that I've used in my career was in clinical medicine. So after going to veterinary school and graduating, I became a clinician working in animal hospitals. And I was also teaching abroad. Um, so when it comes to this incredibly adorable Cavalier King Charles puppy, Cavalier King Charles Spaniel puppy. Uh, you can see the ultrasound machine behind that um, puppy that I was using on the puppy. And an example of one health in this particular situation. Two things to mention with this little cute puppy. Number one, this puppy could have had hookworms. Now that's an intestinal parasite that is actually a big, big problem because that if a dog poops those worms and leaves it on the yard and a person, say like a child, runs barefoot through the yard, those worms can pierce skin and go into a person. That's not good. 
that is not good. So you have to make sure that you treat the puppy. You have to make sure that you care for the environment, the shared environment. And you need to make sure that you educate the owners if there is hookworm in your area. Number two, when it comes to a one health concept, thinking of environmental health, animal health, and human health. Well, with this little puppy, I, of course, spoke to the owners about flea and tick preventative. Now, you might think at this point that flea and tick preventative could be, you know, the outdoors where the puppy or the dog goes. Yes, that would work too. But now I'm talking about the indoor environment. What can the puppy be bringing in to the house? Um, and another part of that is to think about um, when it comes to flea and tick preventative and should it be an oral by mouth medication or a topical on the skin type of medication. That's really important to know if there's a toddler around the house. Why? Why is that important? Because toddlers put their hands everywhere, right? Including in their mouth. So when a toddler, say, pets a puppy or pets a dog, and there's a chemical or a medication on the back of the neck, that's not good for the family. So I think of animal health, they definitely need to have flea and tick preventatives to protect themselves. I think of human health, because if there's a toddler around the house, I want to make sure that there's no exposure to additional medications for that human. And then the environment, the shared indoor um, environment and space between the human, the child and the dog. Another example of One Health and clinical practice um, was here in uh, with me working with an Asian elephant in Thailand. I was cleaning up a wound um, for this animal. And I was also teaching students who want to become veterinarians of various ages. And you may or may not know this, but elephants can carry tuberculosis. That's a big problem because people can get tuberculosis. Now, can an elephant give a person tuberculosis? Yep, yep, that is a big concern. So we have to make sure that the elephants are tested and they're negative before having anybody near them. But more importantly, at this particular animal sanctuary where I was working, we made sure that the vast majority of the public stayed pretty far from the animals to provide them enough space. I obviously had to get close because I was tending to a wound of this elephant. But those diseases that can jump between different species, there's a word for that. It's a term, it's called a zoonotic disease. Zoonotic disease. And when it comes to COVID-19, scientists around the world believe that that's also a zoonotic disease. We'll get into that shortly. My next chapter of my career <laughs> is I became an entrepreneur and I started OneHealthLessons.com. Now this particular website is devoted to talking about One Health, again, the interaction and the teamwork and the thought that animal health and environmental health play into human health. We're all linked, right? So it inspires the next generation to see the world as one. The true mission is to get every student on the planet understanding One Health and becoming passionate about One Health to ultimately change our actions. Now, OneHealthLessons.com certainly has a timeline. Back in 2001, that's when I started teaching. In 2008, that's when I first heard the term One Health, and that was in veterinary school. I honestly wish when I was your age, I had known that term. I developed One Health Lessons um, back in 2016. And then on May 1st of this year, OneHealthLessons.com was launched. And fortunately today, these COVID-19 online lessons that you can find at OneHealthLessons.com for free, might I add, is now being translated into 38 languages by over 130 global volunteers. Now in OneHealthLessons.com, there are several different options for lessons. We're going to dive into COVID-19 lessons. Now you may or may not know what COVID-19 has to do with One Health, 
Maybe you're starting to figure that out from what I said before, but let's just review a little bit more. This here is a beautiful environment. It's a beautiful forest. All the animals are happy and healthy. There's minimal competition for food or shelter. All the trees are getting enough sunlight and enough clean water. It is picturesque. And then something changes. So there are some people now in the picture and you can see some, some trees that are gone. The trees could be gone because of climate change and the, and the environment is no longer hospitable for them. Or it could be because people are using these trees for timber. But look what's happening with the animals. Now, this is the exact same number of animals between here and here, but the animals are becoming shifted, right? And when you get shifted and put in a smaller sp space, then you have to compete more for food, for shelter, and competition can lead to stress. And what happens when you or even when I get stressed, what happens to our bodies? We start to show more signs of illness. Now that could be a real concern, especially when there are animals that don't necessarily really belong near each other. They're just being forced near each other because of the situation. And you could imagine when there are more people, the problems become exacerbated. And when there are more animals near people, there's an increased risk for disease transmission, diseases hopping between different species, including into people. Remember that term zoonotic disease? And remember what I said about COVID-19 be being a zoonotic disease? Now, certainly inappropriate close proximity between different species um, can lead to higher uh, mutations in genes and viruses and bacteria. And this is what we're seeing around the world. As of right now, scientists around the world are saying that three quarters, 75% of infectious diseases, meaning diseases that can be shared between different bodies, um, are originally from animals. And it makes you think, well, why are we getting closer to animals? It's because we're going into their area. Now, this brings home the concept of one health, right? Environmental health, animal health, and human health. Let's say, for instance, because of climate change or because of natural habitat destruction, regardless of the reason, all the birds are gone from this forest. There are going to be consequences, some that you may not expect. You can see less trees when the birds are gone because some birds are pollinators. You can see that some mice, um, there's a increase in the population of mice. Why? Because some birds eat mice and there's that predator prey relationship. Now there's another animal on the slide that has increased in population. Can you see which one? It's the foxes, why? because they have food aplenty, right? There's mice everywhere, they have plenty to eat. And then look how many animals are now near people. And it's because the people are taking over the spot where animals used to be. And remember what I said earlier about how easy it is for a virus, for instance, to mutate? Well, it increases when you have very close proximity between different species. Fortunately, um, with over 130 volunteers around the world, um, the message of One Health is getting out there. And these free COVID-19 lessons are accessible to anybody on the planet who can download these lessons and print them out. So they can be taught online, they can also be printed. Um, and the future of One Health, the future means you guys. Everybody listening, everybody who first is hearing the term One Health today. You are the future of One Health. You are the future of the planet. Here, um, this slide demonstrates how many languages there actually are um, in development for these COVID-19 online lessons. And I feel like the next slide 
truly shows what I want to illustrate. It's not just the differences of language, it's the differences in culture. And I put out the call on social media asking for any volunteer or <laughs> any volunteer in the world, if you're interested in translating these important, timely lessons to get more students to understand where this virus came from, the environment, um, what people can do today to protect themselves, so say physical distancing, you know, um, covering up your sneeze, washing your hands properly, and then also what scientists are doing today to make sure you and your family stay safe in the future. So things like developing vaccines, right, and developing treatment. But there are cultural differences in the world. Even in the United States, there are so many subcultures. So that is why I wanted to have people, instead of just artificial intelligence, translating these lessons, because I want to make sure that these lessons have sustainability. <laughs> it actually meets the needs of students and teachers around the world. Now, I'll just put in a plug. If you want to contribute to language translations, or, and, if you want to promote OneHealthLessons.com in your community, you are more than welcome to do so. You are also welcome to contact me at OneHealthLessons at gmail.com or on LinkedIn, if you have LinkedIn, Deborah Thompson DVM. On Facebook, you can find a page called One Health Lessons, and then there's also a One Health Lessons Instagram page. And then on Twitter, the, the account is OH Lessons, plural. You can see that many students are now just starting to learn about One Health, just starting. Now, again, I wish this was started 20, 30 years ago, but ultimately now's the time to act. We have to get everybody on the planet, understand really what are the consequences of our actions on the environment and how does that play into an animal's health and our own health and our mother's health and our sister's health. You can see this is during the brick and mortar classroom experience where I was teaching um, students. And then this was one of my friends in Uganda teaching one of my lessons about bird flu, another type of viral um, infection. Fortunately, One Health Lessons has been showcased in various international webinars. Here on the left, you could see the United Nations Association in Canada. I was speaking with them last week. And then if you just Google my name, Deborah Thompson, uh, NASA, you can see a about 10 minute video on YouTube about how One Health plays into the, uh, the efforts of NASA and a lot of other global Earth observation um, entities in the world. So. It's a really interesting uh, project that was was happening and still is happening. So coming back full circle, a veterinarian can wear many suits. I have been a clinician for several years, certainly an educator and an entrepreneur, which I'm incredibly grateful for having the support of. And then I'm also um, affiliated with the government working as a science policy advisor. You can see that it just seems like yesterday when I got my rejection letter from veterinary school the first time. <laughs> and I hope you can see that certainly perseverance, curiosity, and remaining flexible pays off in the long run. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, Deborah. Of course, my pleasure. I love how approachable you make your profession and um, how interactive it is. Thanks, that means a lot to me. So uh, we do have an audience question here and I have a few questions myself after listening. Um, let's kick this off with Lara. She's one of our high school students in our summer research program. She wants to know, how do you balance all your interests and responsibilities with your personal life? <laughs> well, it's a good thing that I'm passionate about what I'm doing right now because, oh my gosh, honestly, if you ask any of my friends right now, they, they all know about what One Health is. If they like it or not, they all know it. <laughs> so, you know, it's just a constant stream in my head. 
But the things that I love to do in my personal life, things like hiking, right? Things like if I can get myself onto a kayak, that's the first place you're going to find me. <laughs> so being out in nature, right? And that's just where, honestly, I feel most at home. Um, and at the same time of enjoying nature, I also sometimes have these ideas of, oh, I can teach students about this angle of One Health and how it can be important. Because ultimately, I want the generation of my grandchildren and great grandchildren to have as much nature as I do today. So mm -hmm. I think it ultimately comes down to a passion. <laughs> so hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. It's definitely finding a balance of work and play, I think sounds crucial. Yeah, absolutely. So going back to kind of the meat of your talk, um, I know that you're really passionate about One Health and I wanted to know if it could be applied on a larger scale. And so one of the things that came up for me was the concept of pollution, which we know is due largely to factory farming and animal impact, at least in the United States. If we were to shift to a One Health perspective, could that be applied to solve a problem like that? Yes, thank you for that. Um, just last week or maybe two weeks ago at this point, the United Nations Environment Program put out a very nice lengthy packet that highlighted a One Health approach. So what a, uh, in response to climate change and in response to environmental degradation. So what I mean by an environmental approach means that say, I come to a table and I'm coming with my veterinary knowledge. Then there's a physician coming to the table and then there's a ecologist and then a statistician and then an uh, economist and then, you know, a social scientist. And we're all sitting at the same table and we're bringing our different strengths to the conversation in order to combat a complex problem, such as a pandemic, such as antibiotic resistance, such as pollution. So certainly a One Health approach, meaning teamwork of different strengths and different minds coming together to, to manage um, serious problems is the future of this world. Mm -hmm. um, right now, I know that at least in the United States, there's been a lot of talk on um, Capitol Hill and Washington DC about how we can try to get um, the United States Department of Agriculture speaking more to say the Health and Human Services Department and um, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, and also the EPA, the Environment Protection Agencies. So there's more talk right now, which I'm very grateful for and thankful for, um, that I think if we do use a One Health approach, we're going to be starting to really get a better handle on global problems. Mm -hmm. That that makes a lot of sense. And I also wondered, kind of continuing that train of thought, you talked a lot about the zoonotic diseases um, and how much they are impacted by changes in animal population. Um, when you look at it through a One Health lens, would that look like maybe veterinarians working with people in forestry to improve um, reforestation efforts? Absolutely. Absolutely. And get ecologists in there and get social scientists in there. Because I feel honestly that the social scientists are the glue that holds everybody together. And of course, educators. Mm -hmm. um, but when I say the glue that holds everybody together, the social scientists, we can talk as much as we want about an idea, but it's actually putting that idea into practice. And how is that going to land in a different culture? You know, and that's that's what I was trying to reference when it comes to um, when I was uh, having or asking people to translate around the world. It's instead of the like Google Translate, you know, <laughs> uh, trying to get people involved and in understanding the local communities. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, absolutely. Long answer to your short question. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. And so it's for the education piece. Um, do you think that it would be sort of a natural transition that students today would start learning from a One Health perspective pretty early in contrast to kind of their traditional science education right now? Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Absolutely. So I first learned about One Health when I was 26. And now I'm teaching six year olds about One Health because I wish I knew about One Health when I was six. Like my world would have been so different. And if everybody else's 
uh, world was, you know, the same way, this planet would not be suffering as much as it is. So mm -hmm. uh, we truly have to make a cultural shift. And that's where education comes in. So if there's any high school students out there listening, and like I said, if you have a younger brother or sister, make sure that you bring them to onehealthlessons.com. These are free lessons for you. Um, I want an equal opportunity for students around the world, regardless of your location. That's fantastic. And so this ties into Laura's next question. Um, when you're shifting to that One Health perspective, um, how do you shift the person's perspective to see things from the wildlife and environment point of view, even though some of the problems can be quite remote? Yes, thank you for that question. And it's a tough one. And it's honestly, I think one of the major reasons why the term One Health is not really spoken about. You know, people people are starting to appreciate, okay, pollution might play a role in my health, but they don't think of the, the animal piece. Um, so ultimately what I've come to experience is that you need to know your target audience um, before you approach the concept or the idea of One Health with them. Say for instance, if somebody, is really interested in, I don't know, um, say uh, breast cancer research, for instance, um, or yeah, let's stick with that, cancer research. Uh, when it comes to a part of One Health, comparing veterinary medicine and human medicine, um, cancer doctors that are veterinarians and cancer doctors who are physicians, so human doctors, they actually learn from each other now with lymphoma, with breast cancer, because even though um, me as a veterinarian, I'm treating my uh, you know, uh, golden retriever patients, I'm still using the same techniques um, with surgery as well as for chemotherapy as a human doctor would be using for his or her own patients. Um, and then we can compare, contrast what works, what doesn't work. And that way we can move the needle even further in medicine. And that's called comparative medicine, which is a subset of One Health. Um, so ultimately the answer to your question is truly, you need to understand the target audience. When I talk to say the general public and not just science students in high school, I often say, one Health is teamwork between people who take care of other people, environmental health and animal health. And I make sure that I say people first because ultimately human nature just makes us a little bit on the selfish side, I feel, or, you know, like egocentric. Um, if I were to stay, start with environmental health or animal health in that definition, and that would rely on other people to be altruistic, you know, really empathetic. Um, but, you know, you have to make adjustments on the message. The good thing is One Health is flexible. Mm. So you're saying you can um, kind of tailor the message to attack it from many different perspectives. That's exactly it. Fantastic. And I am curious about the policy level of change and, and incorporating One Health. Um, for those of you watching, just for background, um, Deborah can't talk about her professional career in that realm, but on a kind of a high level, I would like to know um, what does policy change in the One Health realm really look like? Yeah, good question. Um, I can talk about something that's already been introduced and in some public, um, public, bills that are going through um, Capitol Hill. Uh, so there is a, <laughs> it was actually developed back in 2016, this bill. And I don't know how much you all know about government, but a bill grows up hopefully to become a law. So think of a bill as a baby law, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but it has no meaning until the president signs it, both sides of Congress, um, so the House of Representatives and the Senate, both sign off on it, they both agree, and then it becomes law and enforceable. So a baby law, a bill. Um, so there's a bill, actually there's 
four bills right now that mention One Health. There's particularly a bill that's focused on One Health called, in short, the One Health Act. Um, and that is to, meant to get more interaction, more collaboration between the U.S. Department of uh, Agriculture, the um, Health and Human Services, so that's the human health perspective, and other agencies. So thinking of the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, fortunately, there are even more uh, bills in the making across both the House and the Senate side, which is good. But ultimately, I feel like there needs to be more and more and more talk. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. And, and it's great to hear that there is something in the works. Yeah. Oh, and I forgot to mention, um, January, the Senate, the United States Senate uh, unanimously passed. Uh, and keep in mind, this was during impeachment. Time, so unanimous is pretty, you know, that's something, mm -hmm. um, passed a resolution that declared January of this year, January 2020, to be called National One Health Awareness Month. Oh, that's so great. progress made. Progress. That's awesome. Well, Dr. Deborah Thompson, thank you so much for being here with us. My pleasure. Uh, that's, yeah, it's been great hearing from you. And if you are watching and you want to get Deborah's super accessible, easy, interactive lessons, you can go to onehealthlessons.com. If you have any questions remaining, you can always leave them here in the archives of the video and we'll get them to Deborah and get your answers. And we want to thank Silver Sage for sponsoring this week. Uh, it's important to have donors like you. So thank you very much. And Deborah, I hope you have a great day. Likewise. Take care, everybody. Hope you share the message of One Health soon.